Welcome to Searching the Scriptures. Our Bible teacher will be Gunther von Haringa Sr. In this series of studies, we will be focusing on the Book of Judges. Without further ado, let's look into God's Word, the Bible. Welcome to Searching the Scriptures. This is going to be part 14 of the book of Judges, and we're down to Judges chapter 1 and verse 3, uh, which says, And Judah said unto Simeon his brother, Come up with me into my lot, that we may fight against the Canaanites, and I likewise will go with thee into thy lot. So Simeon went with him. And at the close of our last lesson, we were discussing a passage in Genesis 49, uh, verses 5 and 7. Genesis 49, verses 5 and 7. And there we read, and this has to do with Simeon and also Levi. It's a, a prophecy of Jacob uh, as far as uh, what God gave him to uh, say under divine inspiration. And it has to do with each of the 12 tribes. It was a blessing that he gave to them prior to his death. Uh, Simeon and Levi are brethren. Instruments of cruelty are in their habitations. O my soul, come not thou into their secret. Unto their assembly mine honor be not thou united. For in their anger they slew a man, and in their self-will they dig down a wall. Cursed be their anger, for it was fierce, and their wrath, for it was cruel. I will divide them in Jacob and scatter them in Israel. And... I made that in the uh, you know historical context, Jacob could very well have had in mind an incident that had happened uh, involving the Hivites uh, back in uh, Genesis 34. And in this particular instance, Simeon and Levi killed all the males in this one Hivite city as a result of one of their princes, a man by the name of Shechem, who had seen Dinah, who wanted to go out and, uh, I guess, meet some of the other ladies in the land. And he, he lay with her, and as a result of that, then he wanted to marry her. And so he and his father, Hamor, approached Jacob uh, with this proposition. Uh, the sons, in the meantime, are furious uh, because of what had occurred. And so they very deviously... Uh, tell uh, Shechem and his father Hamor, uh, you know, you can marry Dinah on the condition that all of the males in your city be circumcised, just like ourselves. And so they went back to the town, and they told the men of the city, and they explained to them that uh, this would be advantageous because Jacob had a large family, he had many possessions, and they agreed that uh, they would marry each other's wives and, uh, or daughters and sons. And so they would really enter into a covenant uh, which was absolutely forbidden by God. And the sons of Jacob knew that. Uh, nonetheless, uh, we read um, in Genesis 34, 25 to 31, uh, 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 what they had in mind. And this is after all the men had been circumcised. And it came to pass on the third day, when they were sore, and again, as a result of the circumcision, the two, uh, that two of the sons of Jacob, Simeon and Levi, Dinah's brethren, took each man his sword and came upon the city boldly and slew all the males. And they slew Hamor and Shechem his son with the edge of the sword and took Dinah out of Shechem's house and went out. 
the sons of Jacob came upon the slain and spoiled the city because they had defiled their sister. They took their sheep and their oxen and their asses and that which was in the city and that which was in the field and all their wealth and all their little ones and their wives took they captive and spoiled even all that was in the house. And Jacob said to Simeon and Levi, Ye have troubled me to make me stink among the inhabitants of the land, among the Canaanites and the Perizzites. And I, being few in number, they shall gather themselves together against me and slay me, and I shall be destroyed, I and my house. And they said, Should he deal with our sister as with an harlot? And so we can see where because of this, um, and this is not altogether, I'm sure, what, what Jacob had in mind, but uh, quite possibly this is one incident uh, that, that God used uh, at least to bring to his remembrance. And there's obviously much more spiritual truth uh, in Genesis 49, 5-7 that we want to look at uh, today. We want to go a little deeper into that. But I was also thinking as I was reading this, uh, in a way it reminded me of a New Testament passage uh, in Luke 9, 51 to 56. And this involved uh, James and his brother John, the two sons of Zebedee. And it presents a similar mindset, uh, one of, you know, uh, taking matters into their own hands and that we see as with Simeon and Levi the only difference is is that the Lord was there at the time and and the Lord uh, rebuked uh, James and John as we're going to see here in Luke 9 51 to 56 because of their attitude uh, at that particular time uh, Luke 9 51 to 56. And it came to pass when the time was come that he should be received up, he steadfastly set his face to go to Jerusalem. Speaking of the Lord Jesus. And sent messengers before his face, and they went and entered into a village of the Samaritans to make ready for him. And they did not receive him, because his face was as though he would go to Jerusalem. And when his disciples James and John saw this, they said, Lord, wilt thou that we command fire to come down from heaven and consume them, even as Elijah did? But he turned and rebuked them and said, Ye know not what manner of spirit ye are of. For the Son of Man is not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. And they went to another village. And so this is, uh, you know, why I would like to get a, a closer look at Genesis 49, 5-7, because we're trying to identify... Simeon and, and who he represents uh, or what he represents spiritually. And of course, all of Genesis 49 is a very rich uh, 
account in, in, in spiritual terms or in parabolic terms. Uh, I'll read it again. Simeon and Levi are brethren. Instruments of cruelty are in their habitations. O my soul, come not thou into their secret. Unto their assembly, mine honor, be not thou united. For in their anger they slew a man, and in their self-will they dig down a wall. Cursed be their anger, for it was fierce, and their wrath, for it was cruel. I will divide them in Jacob and scatter them in Israel. So this, and of course, you know, we're, we're interested in this and, and somewhat perplexed because these are supposed to be blessings. As we read, uh, you know, in Genesis 49, verse 1, uh, this is how this chapter is introduced to us. And this doesn't seem uh, hardly a blessing. And Jacob uh, called unto his sons and said, Gather yourselves together that I may tell you that which shall befall you in the last days. Actually, uh, I, I, I apologize, I'm wrong about this. Uh, I was getting this mixed up with another account. This is actually uh, referring to our uh, days. There's another chapter, which I believe is Deuteronomy 33, uh, which, uh, if I'm not mistaken about that, that does have to do with the elect. But because this is talking about the last days, and I should have read this first, um, this is actually going to be speaking, uh, I think as we, as we find out, that it has to do with our day. And, and that's why it, it's not blessings necessarily at all, even though there are some positive statements uh, that are attributed to the various sons of Jacob. Uh, but definitely, in terms of Simeon and Levi, uh, there uh, is no, uh, nothing positive about uh, these statements. Uh, okay, the first phrase, instruments of cruelty are in their habitations, is comprised of three words. Uh, since uh, are in is actually in um, parentheses and it's supplied by the translators and so it's not in the original text. Uh, so the three words are instruments, which is Strong's number 3627, of cruelty, Strong's number 2555, and lastly, their habitations. Uh, Strong's number 4380. And I think I'd like to start with this word habitations first uh, to try to uh, get a handle on this. Uh, it's only used once uh, and in this verse and apparently it has a root word which is rendered as furnace. And it's rendered as such in nine verses but it's not a definitive root word. Uh, they, the way they put it uh, is that it probably comes from this root word. And so we have to be very careful because it's, it's not something that we can, you know, absolutely trust. However, I did find another word which has a different Strong's number in Psalm 7420. And it's also rendered in English as habitations and its Strong's number is 4990. And what's interesting about this word is that it's actually connected uh, in the same sentence to the same word cruelty that we find here uh, in uh, Genesis uh, 49, um, uh, verse 5. Uh, and that's, again... Um, uh, cruelty is Strong's number 2555. But this other word, uh, which is translated habitations of uh, 4990, appears in 12 citations and it's translated as habitations, pastures, houses, and places. Now, with the exception of two verses, uh, out of these 12, and that would be Psalm 23, 2 and Psalm 65, 12, 
uh, all of the other ten references pertain to either the end of the church age or they have to do with the day, our current day of judgment. Uh, and we'll look at uh, these two that are the exceptions, uh, and uh, I'm sure they're going to be uh, familiar to you. One uh, is uh, very familiar. It's Psalm 23, verse 2. Uh, that, that beautiful psalm that David penned under divine inspiration, uh, having to do uh, with, with the believer, with the true child of God. Psalm 23. I'll, I'll read verse 1 as well. Jehovah is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. Uh, so here we have uh, a picture. And by the way, the word here is uh, translated pastures. The word for habitations is pastures. And we see the very tranquil um, rest that God's people enjoy because of salvation. And we also uh, find something similar uh, in verse 12 of Psalm 65, 9 through 13. Psalm 65, nine through 13. And here it's, it's speaking about nature, but we can see spiritually uh, where, this, uh, where this applies, where this has, has a, a rich uh, spiritual meaning for the child of God. Thou visitest the earth and waterest it. Thou greatly enrichest it with the river of God, which is full of water. Thou preparest them corn. Again, corn is grain having to do with, with the word of God, which is the bread of life. When thou hast so provided for it, thou waterest the ridges thereof abundantly. Thou settlest the furrows thereof. Thou makest it soft with showers. Thou blessest the springing thereof. Thou crownest the year with thy goodness and thy paths drop fatness. They drop upon the pastures of the wilderness. Uh, and here is this word, habitations, upon the pastures. And the little hills rejoice on every side. The pastures, uh, once again, um, no, actually this is a different word. The pastures are clothed with flocks, the valleys also are covered over with corn. They shout for joy. They also sing. And so, you know, God is using this, this scene in nature, which is really typifying the life of the believer, the one that God has saved and the one that God continues to sustain spiritually moment by moment, day after day, year after year, Decade after decade, we see God's great hand of mercy and God's hand of goodness uh, in the believer's life. As we know, it says in Philippians 2.13 that he works in us to will and to do of his good pleasure. Now, um, 
Again, these are, are positive verses, the only two out of 12 where this word uh, habitations is used. And we're going to look at some of these other citations and they paint an entirely different spiritual landscape, one that is actually devoid of God's blessings and it's replete with his judgment. Uh, the first one we want to look at is Lamentations 2, 1 through 2. And here it is translated as all the habitations. Uh, Lamentations 2, uh, 1 through 2. And immediately you'll recall that, that this uh, has to do with the, the end of the church age. How hath Jehovah covered the daughter of Zion with a cloud in his anger, and cast down from heaven unto the earth the beauty of Israel, and remembered not his footstool in the day of his anger. Jehovah hath swallowed up all the habitations of Jacob, and hath not pitied. He hath thrown down in his wrath the strongholds of the daughter of Judah, he hath brought them down to the ground. He hath polluted the kingdom and the princes thereof. We also um, can go to Jeremiah 23, which is a chapter that uh, the whole chapter really is speaking about the, the end of the church age. And we're going to look at the first 10 verses. Uh, and verse 10 uh, is uh, where this uh, word is translated, habitations is translated, the pleasant places. And these pleasant places are dried up. And uh, again, this is all having to do with the end of the church age, and it's really describing the abomination of desolation, which is standing in the holy place. Uh, as we read in Matthew 24, 15. Uh, again, this is uh, Jeremiah 23, 1 through 10. Woe be unto the pastors that destroy and scatter the sheep of my pasture, saith Jehovah. Therefore thus saith Jehovah God of Israel against the pastors that feed my people. Ye have scattered my flock and driven them away, and have not visited them. Behold, I will visit upon you the evil of your doings, saith Jehovah. And I will gather the remnant of my flock out of all countries whither I have driven them, and will bring them again to their folds, and they shall be fruitful and increase. And I will set up shepherds over them, which shall feed them, and they shall fear no more, nor be dismayed, neither shall they be lacking, saith Jehovah. Behold, the days come, saith Jehovah, that I will raise unto David a righteous branch, and a king shall reign and prosper, and shall execute judgment and justice in the earth. In his days Judah shall be saved, and Israel shall dwell safely. And this is his name, whereby he shall be called the Lord, or Jehovah, our righteousness. Therefore, behold, the days come, saith Jehovah, that they shall no more say, Jehovah liveth, which brought up the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt, but Jehovah liveth, which brought up and which led the seed of the house of Israel out of the north country and from all countries whither I had driven them and they shall dwell in their own land. Mine heart within me is broken because of the prophets. All my bones shake. I am like a drunken man and like a man whom wine hath overcome because of Jehovah. And because of the words of his holiness. For the land is full of adulterers. For because of swearing the land mourneth. 
the pleasant places of the wilderness are dried up, and their course is evil, and their force is not right. And then he continues throughout the whole chapter, uh, uh, denouncing them, uh, denouncing the pastors and, and leaders, you know, of... Um, really of the of the church age uh, the the institutional churches and denomination and and notice how he keeps repeating the pastors those are the ones that are being addressed and you know it's very much like what we read in Matthew 23 uh 13 to 38 in which Jesus takes the uh, the Pharisees and the, and the scribes and the lawyers to task in that chapter, and uh, uh, you know, he is uh, condemning them because he is about to divorce himself from national Israel because of their high places, which in turn is a picture of God abandoning the local churches and denominations uh, during the 1955 years of the church age, and we know that that took place on May 21. 1988. Uh, again, this is Matthew 23, 13 to 38. <clears throat> uh, I don't think there's a more... Uh, scathing denouncement uh, in all of scriptures in this in terms of the and again this is God himself uh, making this uh, pronouncement against them uh, but woe unto you scribes and Pharisees hypocrites for ye shut up the kingdom of heaven against men for ye neither go in yourselves neither suffer ye them that are entering to go in Woe unto you, scribes, Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye devour widows' houses, and for a pretense make long prayer. Therefore ye shall receive the greater damnation. Woe unto you, scribes, and scribes, Pharisees, and hypocrites, for ye compass sea and land to make one proselyte, and when he is made, ye make him twofold more the child of hell, than yourselves. Woe unto you, ye blind guides, which say, Whosoever shall swear by the temple, it is nothing. But whosoever shall swear by the gold of the temple, he is a debtor. Ye fools and blind, for whether is greater the gold or the temple that sanctifieth the gold. And whosoever shall swear by the altar, it is nothing. But whosoever sweareth by the gift that is upon it, he is guilty. Ye fools and blind, for whether is greater the gift or the altar that sanctifieth the gift. Whoso therefore shall swear by the altar, sweareth by it, and by all things thereon. And whoso shall swear by the temple, sweareth by it, and by him that dwelleth therein. And he that shall swear by heaven sweareth by the throne of God, and by him that sitteth thereon. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For ye pay tithe of mint and anise and cumin, and have omitted the weightier matters of the law, judgment, mercy, and faith. The, these ought ye to have done, and not to leave the other undone. Ye blind guides would strain at a gnat and swallow a camel. Woe unto you, scribes, Pharisees, and hypocrites. Excuse me. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. For you may clean the outside of the cup and of the platter, but within they are full of extortion and excess. Thou blind Pharisee, cleanse first that which is within the cup and platter, 
that the outside of them may be clean also. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye are like unto whited sepulchres, which indeed appear beautiful outward, but are within full of dead men's bones, and of all uncleanness. Even so ye also outwardly appear righteous unto men, but within ye are full of hypocrisy and iniquity. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, because ye build the tombs of the prophets and garnish the sepulchres of the righteous, and say, If we had been in the days of our fathers, we would not have been partakers with them in the blood of the prophets. Wherefore ye be witnesses unto yourselves that ye are the children of them which killed the prophets, Fill ye up then the measure of your fathers, ye serpents, ye generation of vipers. How can ye escape the damnation of hell? Wherefore, behold, I send unto you prophets and wise men and scribes, and some of them ye shall kill and crucify, and some of them shall ye scourge in your synagogues and persecute them from city to city that upon you may come all the righteous blood shed upon the earth, from the blood of righteous Abel unto the blood of Zechariah, son of Berechias, whom ye slew between the temple and the altar. Verily I say unto you, all these things shall come upon this generation. O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, Thou that killest the prophets, and stonest them which are sent unto thee, how often would I have gathered thy children together, even as a hen gathereth her chickens under her wings, and ye would not. Behold, your house is left unto you desolate. And that's really the the crux of the matter in terms of the divorce having to do with national Israel when Christ hung on the cross and the veil of the temple was torn from top to bottom. Uh, Jerusalem was no longer the holy city. The temple was no longer holy. And God had just completely divorced himself from them. But the second picture, the other side of the coin, is that of the New Testament churches and denominations. God simply abandoned them as we read in, in just a couple of verses down in uh, Matthew 24, 1. And Jesus went out and departed from the temple. Physically, he might have walked out of the temple that day. But all of Matthew 24 is speaking about our day. It's speaking about the end of the world. It is speaking about the abomination of desolation as we read here in Matthew 24, 15. Well, we're going to have to bring our uh, lesson to a close today. We'll pick up, Lord willing, next time. Thank you for joining us today for Searching the Scriptures. Until next time, to God be the glory.